Well, we're continuing on our, our series, uh, Holy, Holy. Oh, and I forgot because I've prayed like three times already today regarding a tropical storm named Debbie. So if your name's Debbie, you may want to, like, I had nothing to do with that, okay? <laughs> um, and uh, we're believing, as always, that thing is slow down and die at sea. Yeah. And I know everybody's got their predictions and satellites and computers and everything else, but God can do anything. Yeah. I said, God can do anything. And uh, I was going to say, we need the rain. Actually, we don't. But um, if we get it, just rejoice in it, okay? All right. We're going to be all right. We're going to be all right. Um, when I was in sixth grade, uh, I moved to a new school, and they had this group come from Orlando of musicians, and we had an outdoor assembly. And they had a trumpet player and a saxophone player and a drummer and I think they had clarinet and keyboards and stuff. And I, I listened to that trumpet player and I thought, I got to do that. I just got to do that. It just lit something in me. And so I started playing band in sixth grade. And to start with, it was rough. <laughs> and then over time, it just became really a, a central part of my, of my life. And I played in uh, middle school and then junior high and then high school and college and got to travel with some music groups and uh, do a bunch with that. And then I've played in church over the years, and I might bring it back. But um, when I was in high school, I had a friend of mine named Steve. He was also a trumpet player. And his dad went on a business trip, and he stopped at a pawn shop and saw this trumpet, old trumpet case, old trumpet, dusty, and his dad bought it, and I believe it was for $35. I think that was the price, because it's been a while. It was last century. <laughs> okay. And $35. And he brought it home, and he brought it to school, and he was excited about it. My dad found this thing. And um, my band director took a, a look at it and said, none of you know what you even have. And so the, the shopkeeper at that point they didn't have the internet, couldn't Google search, you know, what this might would be worth. And uh, if, if you know trumpets, this will mean something to you. It was a Bach Stradivarius Model 37 Mount Vernon. Now, Mount Vernon was when Bach instruments were made in Mount Vernon, New York, and they were handmade. So everything about them was hand, handmade. And they later moved to there's too much information for you. I don't even know why I remember, but Elkhart, Indiana. And now a lot of it's automated. And so this guy didn't know that this thing was worth way more than $35. The shopkeeper, uh, my friend's dad, even he didn't know. Till someone knew and said, do you know what you have here? Do you know what this is worth? Had he not known what it was worth, he probably would have used that old horn in the dusty case for parades and for marching band, which I had an old beater horn. Well, it was a Sears silver tone <laughs> that I borrowed from a buddy of mine. That's what I use for marching band and for, for uh, parades and stuff because that's when they get beat up. But here's, here's the point I want to make. Once you know the value of something, once you know what something's worth, you treat it a little differently. And you're priceless. You're a masterpiece. Ephesians 2.10 says that you're God's handiwork. You're literally a, a work of art that God has made you. And you have great value. And the enemy of your soul, he will devalue you and devalue you until you start to do it too. So you need to know what you're worth. You need to know because then you'll start to maybe handle yourself a little differently. And you are fearfully and wonderfully made spirit, soul, and body. And as we've been talking about, and I'll say this probably five times through this message, we've got to do a better job of our care and maintenance and cooperation of our spirit, of our soul, and of our body. Can I get an amen from anybody at all here today? First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 and 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our lord jesus christ he who calls you is faithful who will also do it which 
really reminds us that we can't do it ourselves, but we certainly can cooperate much better than we currently are. Can I get an amen? So again, you are a spirit. Say, I am a spirit. I have a soul. I live in a body. Remember also, we talked a few weeks ago about the four circles, so to speak, of your life. The more I think about it, there's probably some other there, but let's just keep it general here. Four circles. You've got biological, psych, psychological, social, and spiritual. And they all kind of interweave together there, and it's how you work. So again, better care and better cooperation starts with a better understanding. So I think the more that we understand about spirit, soul, body, about our worth, about our purpose, uh, I think we'll, we'll be more inclined, more uh, inspired for better care and better cooperation concerning those. Well, uh, today I want to talk about your body. Okay, everybody say my body. Now, that's not necessarily what you look like. We're, we're talking about the function because I don't want y'all to get all freaked out about you know, my body. Everybody say my body. All right. It is your earth suit. It's what you wear to live here. It connects you to the physical world around you. It is how you uh, experience and participate in this physical world. You have your five senses. And those five senses, uh, let's see, sight, I can see, I can hear, I can smell, I can taste, I can touch. And notice this, that's for another message altogether, but all five of those are for right now. Yeah. They're not for the past or for the future, it's for now. It's to help you right here because you've got to stay right here. Uh, there's a term for it in psychology called mindfulness, that you're just staying right here. It's actually very, very good for you rather than you being the time traveler that you are constantly in the past and in the future. You're better right here. And your, your senses are a part of helping to keep you grounded in that way. Your spirit and your soul express themselves through the body. So your body, say my body again. My body is actually a vehicle. It's like a physical container that carries and transports you it carries you around. Remember, I am a spirit. I have a soul. And my vehicle is my body. This is how I get around. And my spirit, my soul express themselves through the body. If I have a heart to serve or a heart to help, guess what? My body is going to do that, but it's coming from the, from the inside. And so the body is very, very important in expressing both the spirit and the soul. So it's a physical container that carries and transports you. But guess what else your body is? Your body is also the physical container. It's a temple of the Holy Spirit, of the Holy Spirit. Now, look with me if you're a believer. Look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20 in the Amplified Bible. It says, do you not know? And so what this is, it's reminding us or it's informing us. Do you not know that your body, everybody say it again, my body. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is within you, whom you have received as a gift from God and that you are, come on, help me. You're not your own. You're not your own property. I like that way it put it. You were bought with a price. You were actually purchased with the precious blood of Jesus and made his own. Come on, so read the last part with me. So then, honor and glorify God with your body. Everybody say, my body. So your body is a temple. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And Paul said, do you not know? He said, you need to stay reminded of that. Because even in his context here, things he was having to correct in the lives of the believers at Corinth, he said, here's the problem. I don't even think you're a rebel. I don't think that you're trying to do this or that. He said, I think you've forgotten or you don't know that the Holy Spirit lives in you. And we do well and we do better in life when we remember the Holy Spirit lives in me. I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit. And if my body is the temple, of the, my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, uh, it behooves me that I take better care of the body, that I don't let it be a rundown, dusty, dirty, cluttered, 
Are you all with me or are you ignoring me? Hey, don't worry, you're going to get madder at me as the message goes, okay? And then we'll be all happy when we leave, though. So it's going to be worth, it'll be worth the journey here. You, your spirit, your soul, and your body are divinely designed to operate as what I call an integrated unit. There's a holy balance here of spirit, soul, and body that they all kind of work together, combining, coordinating, interdependent, harmonizing, functioning as uh, in that holy balance. Each aspect of the spirit, soul, and body, we've got to maintain at an optimal level so that we can operate and live and function as God really designed for us to do. And so we've got to have all three of these healthy and well, spirit, soul, and body. Amen. And they work together in that integrated unit. You're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And if you look through all of that, the spirit, soul, and body. We're to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And worship is very expressive. Just read through the Psalms. We've got things in the New Testament as well of lifting our hands and bowing our knees and bowing our head and singing loud and all of those things. It's spirit, it's soul, and it's body. And we worship best and we serve best and we live best and, and we are at our best and we are the happiest when we have all of this working as that integrated unit. So that's why spirit, soul, and body, we must be holy, holy, completely set apart for God. And all of us, come on, all of us can do a better job. I said all of us can do a better job with the care and the cooperation of our spirit, our soul, and our body. Now, we all want to, and we all need to do a better job with this. And uh, we all want to and need to care for and cooperate in the maintenance and the condition of our bodies. Now, let me tell you up front, this is practical, because I'm going to give you some really practical stuff today. So I want you to think, well, I didn't come to church to hear all this. Well, you're here now. Okay. Some real practical things, but you're going to see bottom line, though, it's all spiritual as well because of how this divine design of how, how you, are set, you are set up. Because this is what I don't want to happen anymore in my life. I don't want it to happen in your life that we're too tired. We're too weak. Don't care. Don't feel good. I can't show up, don't feel like praying, don't feel like reading. I don't even feel like being nice. Because, you know, when we let all of this down and we don't care for this temple like we should, and it's a broken down old temple, um, it's hard for the fruit of the Spirit even to grow in us. Kindness, peace, all of that, that's goodness. I am not in the mood for any fruit of the Spirit because we're tired and we don't feel good. And, and all of that, and that shuts down the expression of our spirit, our soul, and the Holy Spirit and what he wants to do. Now, I don't know if you know this yet, or you've surrendered to this yet, or you realize this really, really up close, but we're all aging. <laughs> I told you, don't worry, you're gonna get madder than this in just a few. <laughs> we're all aging, but don't do that passively. Amen. And don't surrender. I don't care how old you are. Just keep going and be aggressive and be a, a, a intentional. And I want to help you with some of that. Uh, because our bodies, as we age, and the age I am in now, I'm redefining ages. And so I say I'm the new 45. So I don't know about you. But it seems like I was just in junior high. Seriously. I was just there. And I'm pretty sure in my little mind, and I might be off, but in my mind, I think I can outrun any of you. <laughs> and I could wrestle you. I wrestled for a couple of years. I could wrestle you, and I'm wiry, and I'll get around you, and I'm going to pin you. <laughs> or put you in the sleeper, which is illegal. But I just kind of feel that way inside, and I want to continue to feel that way. Yeah. When I woke up this morning, I was eager to get here and to do what God has called me to do. I'm eager to do that. And 
I got to, and this is not bragging on me at, at all, but I had the energy yesterday. My, my youngest son and his wife and baby, they, they were moving into a house. They got a, they got a house. And, and to go and to help them, you know, to be able to do stuff. And there were some other guys helping. They said, Pastor, can we get that for you? Go, no. <laughs> and so don't age passively. And can I tell you, as you age at all, your body is going to be less and less forgiving. So maybe things you did and ate when you were in junior high. So we've got a couple of goals here. First goal, strength. Come on, everybody say it. Strength. You want to have strength. I don't care how old you are. Secondly, mobility. Come on, say it. Mobility. You've got to be able to get around. Thirdly, cognition. Cognition. So I want to have the rest of my life. I'm believing God. And you say, well, I don't know if you can believe that. I'm believing God that I can live a full, long life. He will satisfy me with long life and show me his salvation. I believe, I believe I'm going to live a long, full life. My times are in his hands. So I'm just going to trust all that. But I'm believing, and there's promises in God's word. And I think the more I cooperate, the more I can do on this. Proverbs talked about also that you could have long life and peace. I don't want to have long life and misery. I want to have long life and peace. But we've got to cooperate, and I believe God will help us with this. But as we go on, make it a priority for you that you, you want strength, you want mobility, and you want cognition. Now look at me. Everybody look at me for this. This is not a house of condemnation. This is not a house of shame. And I want everybody to look at me. And it is never too late to start to do something different and better. Amen. Never too late. <laughs> never too late. Now, first big word is consistency. Consistency. Here's a, a principle I learned years ago. Consistency beats intense effort every time. Come on, say that with me. Consistency beats intense effort every time every time. It's the day by day. It's what you do day by day takes you to your future. Watching Olympians, that's one of the uniting fun things right now for our nation is watching our athletes. And, uh, you know, watching them, I, I don't think they train just a couple times. I'm kind of good at this, so I'll go to the Olympics. <laughs> you know, they have worked and they have worked and they have worked and they have worked. And if you read or hear some of the interviews about their discipline and their commitment to this, I mean, it is years and years and years made up of weeks and weeks and weeks made up of days and days and days made up of hours and hours and hours. And what we've got to be is consistent. We fool ourselves sometimes. Everything from Bible study to eating right to working out. We do it two days in a row. We go, yeah, I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> Next thing you know, it's Christmas, months later. <laughs> you know I work out. Yeah, that was in March. <laughs> and so it's consistency. Come on, everybody say consistency. So I want to share with you four categories here today. This is practical. This is also spiritual. First of all, feed and fuel. Feed and fuel. Come on, say it. Feed and fuel. And second part of that, and hydrate. And hydrate. 60% of your body is water. First, one of the first signs of dehydration, you ready? Is a headache is a headache, and some of you are medicating what you should just go get some water, y'all. Take a water break. Feed and fuel and hydrate. Our American diet tastes great. I want to show you a picture. I got a picture of it. <laughs> it's still too early for that, y'all. The American diet is totally driven by money. And we're sold this, and I've eaten a few of those things in the not too distant past. <laughs> and you too, some of you are salivating right now. You're like, <laughs> but listen to this. It tastes great. You've been sold it, but it is horrible for you. And there are numerous things just right there that are outlawed in nations in Europe because they've been around long enough to realize that some of those artificial colors and ingredients and so forth are horrible for you. 
And I want you to think about, if you're watching TV at all, especially in the evening, you're going to get a lot of food commercials and a lot of restaurant commercials. And if you'll look at that, you'll realize all of that is bad for me. And it sets you up, and we'll talk about the brain a little more next week. It sets you up so you want that the next day. And because we're used to that. And our body's responding to some things that we don't need to be responding to. In 440 B.C., Hippocrates said this, Let food be thy medicine, and let thy medicine be food. And uh, I think if we let our food be our medicine, we'll probably need less medicine. Eat as close as possible to natural. Get informed. Get educated. Alicia has, has... educated herself in this and had me listen to things and we've listened to podcasts there's some very credible people that have broke with some of the current thought of just falling in the whole wave with the whole culture and talking straight about how we eat and how we can eat better and fuel and feed our bodies in a better way get educated read labels and if there's things on labels that you can't pronounce or you don't have in your spice cabinet or pantry at home probably should put that down we've got to make best choices sometimes we're out to a restaurant and we've just got to make our best choice you know in that setting you've got to break some habits and mindsets you're gonna you're gonna have to make some new habits and mindsets You probably are going to need to take some supplements. Well, supplements cost a lot of money. Yeah, but you're ordering not only this food, but you're having it delivered too. (laughs) So don't tell me you can't afford some supplements. And then can I go there? I'm just going to go there. Alcohol. Now, it's socially acceptable. It's legal. Um, Even as a believer, a lot lot will teach. And listen, it's not house condemnation. I just got to talk to you, okay? Um, that you have the liberty to drink, but you do not have the liberty to cause anyone else to stumble. Okay, I'll say that. And then here's the other thing. Paul said, all things for me are lawful, but not everything's good for me. So I can do it, but it's not good for me. And so just a quick look at alcohol. Every time you drink, and I know you got peer pressure and social pressure and all of those things, and I don't condemn you. I don't at all. I'm, I'm concerned about you. Every time you drink, it hurts your brain, your heart, your digestion, and it makes you prone to injury and possible trouble. You know, we've said over the years, we've never in all of our years of ministry had somebody come to us and say, you know, our life, our family, everything is better now that we're drinking. And I've been a chaplain with the sheriff's office for about 23, 24 years. And I've done a lot of ride-alongs over those years. And I tell you, nothing good has ever come out of alcohol on any of those nights that I've been out for a ride. You think about it. Feed and fuel the temple. And hydrate with the right things. Also on feed and fuel, to quote my wife, Breakfast is love. You need to eat a good breakfast. What's the word? Break fast. It needs to be good at that point. Now, I grew, I grew up on instant oatmeal, apple and cinnamon flavored, and Pop-Tarts. Come on, y'all. And all kinds of cereals. Listen, we can do better. We need to do better on all of that. There are some that advocate for this, too. You should have breakfast, eat like a king or queen. Lunch, eat like a princess or prince. And dinner, eat like a pauper. Start your day that way. And see, what a lot of people do, we start out big, then we go to all you can eat (laughs) for lunch, and then we go all you can eat plus the endless dessert bar, and then a snack when we get home. I think we can do better with the care and cooperation of taking care of the body. Can somebody say amen? Amen. I know you're mad at me. It gets better here in a moment. (laughs) Feed and fuel. Secondly, move and exercise. Come on, say it. Move and exercise. And let me add one other one to it too. Stretch. Stretch. Take a cue. Take a cue from babies, puppies, and kitties. 
First thing they do when they're getting up, they're, they're going to be stretching. Your body is made to stretch, and as you do that, it increases flexibility, range of motion, blood flow, helps you to avoid injury and stretch. You know, I don't feel like stretching. Everything's tight. It's because you're not stretching. And just, again, a key word would be consistency. I didn't come to church to hear this. Well, like I said, you're here now, and this is both practical and spiritual. Because if you're all stiff and tired and grumpy and everything else because of what's going on in your body, you're never going to be able to live that integrated unit of really serving God with your spirit and your soul and the Holy Spirit himself. We've got to do a better job with the vehicle. Amen. As you exercise, make sure it's appropriate to your age and, and your current health. Work on balance as well. I'm not talking about Olympics balance beam and, and all of that, but it'd be good on you if you could get to that. But sometimes I've started doing this more and more, the, just the curbs like in a parking lot, if no one's looking, <laughs> and kind of get on there and walk, and walk that out. It is good for you in so many different ways. Move and exercise. It is said, because we live such a sedentary lifestyle, that sitting is the new smoking. And we just sit and sit and sit and, and watch and listen and eat. Exert yourself. Don't just, you know, barely do something. Exert yourself. Push yourself. Push some weights. Have some kind of resistance. Can I tell you again? It's never too late. Amen. It's never too late. It's going to help you all the way across. It helps your muscles, your joints, your heart, your organs, your brain, your mood, and your confidence. Find some stairs, get up, and walk up and down some stairs. We, we have escalators, and we have people movers and airports and everything else. Will you just walk and take some steps and some stairs? Walk, and when you walk, walk like you're late for something. You have two speeds you should make sure you hit every day. Walk like you're late for something. I mean, get there. And then the other speed is this, walk slow and breathe deep. You need to do all of those every day where you're like, I, I got to get there. Now, don't run over people and be rude in the grocery store or whatever, okay? Don't be, uh, Alicia and I, when we go to amusement park or whatever, we do a thing called shoot the gap. And it's because so many people are like, oh, look at that. And we're like. <laughs> so shoot the gap, y'all. Move and exercise. Third. Rest and sleep. And can I add to the list? Naps. Naps are good. Oh, come on. Come on. Oh, good. You like me again. <laughs> Jesus took a nap on the boat, y'all. Rest and sleep. The creation order is this. Work and then rest. Work and then rest. Everybody else is resting up for something. You need to work and then rest, and then you're going to rest better. Make sure that you're not hindering your rest. Make sure that you're not hindering your sleep. Um, stress, worry, uh, what we call before bed behaviors. Before bed behaviors. TV, screens, food, caffeine, alcohol, the temperature, light, mattress. You spend a third of your life in bed. Lisa and I were just talking about it. I think we need a new bed. Because after, after a while, you're wondering why you can't get up in the morning. It's because you're in a gully. <laughs> and so maybe you need a new mattress or flip that thing over. Maybe you have medical issues. Get, get some help. Psalm 127, verse 2. It is vain. It's a waste for you to rise up early and to sit up late to eat the bread of sorrows or anxious toils. For he gives his beloved sleep. Other translations say he gives to his beloved in their sleep. Sleep is vital for us. Feed and fuel and hydrate. Move and exercise. Rest and sleep. And claim and declare these promises. I work these into my prayer every night as I'm going to sleep. Proverbs 3.24. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. Yes, you will lie, you will lie down and your sleep will will be sweet. Psalm 8, 4, or 4, 8. I will both lie down in peace and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell 
in safety. You'd be, you would do well to pray before you go to sleep, to allow some time and come in for a landing, have some routines that you go through, caring for yourself, caring for your, here we go, your teeth, your gums, your face, and, and hydrate and do what you need to do and come in for a landing. Uh, Alicia, what did we call it? Tucks and tails or something when the babies were little, a routine that you would do with them so that they knew, hey, we're headed toward bed and we've got to all do a better job so that we can land and have the rest that we need. And then lastly, and I'm going to leverage off of last week's message, you need to monitor and manage your soul. Go back and listen to last week's message, but monitor and manage your soul. He restores your soul, but you've got to monitor your soul and manage your soul. What could be in my soul? What might be happening in my soul that actually could affect my body? And it does. Even just your central nervous system, part of your body, is fueled and triggered by what's going on in your emotions and thoughts. And so if I have fear or worry or whatever going, my central nervous system acts off of that, impacting the rest of my body. So what might be going on in my soul? Cares, cuts, or hurts, clutter, companions, hanging out with some wrong folks, calluses, you've just gotten used to some things, worry, fear, shame, loneliness, on and on these could go. That, the New Testament word for worry and anxiety, it's a Greek word called marimna, and its definition describes what it does to your body. Part of the definition is this, to divide, to tear, to rip apart. And what happens when we worry, when we have anxiety, have y'all heard of these, worry and anxiety, have you heard of those? When we have that going on, our brains then trigger neurotransmitters, which are chemicals. And those chemicals are released, and they are powerful chemicals. You can't live around the clock with these things in your system. And it triggers these chemicals, neurotransmitters, that get you ready for action. But guess what? There's no action to be taken. We're worrying, we're fretting, we're anxious about this or that, and now it kicks off into my body, sends it out for action because of how you're wired, and there's no action to take. And so you know what, what it does? It just has to course through your system and then finally come to a halt, and what does it do along the way? It divides you, it tears you, it rips you up. It has a horrible impact on your respiration, on your heart, on your digestion, on everything else until it just kind of dissipates in your body. And we can do better than this. And so we've got to monitor our soul. Every night I'll say, I will lie down unafraid. I thank you that you give me sweet sleep and sweet dreams. I will lie down in peace and you will bless me even in my sleep. And you've got to let those go and cast your cares. And I forgive everyone of everything. And I forgive myself. And I thank you for your goodness in my life. And when you, when you do that, when you monitor and manage your soul in that way, I'll tell you what, it frees you up and it cuts off some of that other stuff that come back and hurt your body. Your body is not your own. It is God's. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Your body is the vehicle and the container that carries and transports your, your soul and your, and your spirit. And we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice to God, to worship him and to serve him. We all, I think, will agree, I can cooperate better. I can give better care to my spirit, to my soul, but yes, to my body. Because I might have all the goods and good intentions, but I can't get there or I don't feel like it. You know, it's just going to so hinder the life that God wants us to have and the life that he wants to live through us. Let's be that integrated unit with that holy balance, living holy, holy for God. And look at me again. I know this is very, very practical, but this is incredibly spiritual, and it's totally important that we take care, better care of our bodies. Amen? Did y'all get anything at all out of this right now?